Hi everyone, my name's Lorna. I'm VP of Developer Experience at Redockly. Um, today I want to talk about OpenAPI and particularly how it relates to us as documentarians. I really believe that documentation is a huge multiplier. It's a big part of what I do in terms of developer experience and it's something that I have always believed in. OpenAPI is a standard way of describing your API. It's not new, the standard was called Swagger a long time ago, um, but it's been around um, for a number of years as OpenAPI. It's a widely used standard. I would go so far as to say it's the most widely used standard today, um, but it's also an open standard. And that's really important because it means that you can see everything about the standard. You can see what's coming, what's under discussion for the next versions of the standards. And it also means that all sorts of providers of tools and resources can be confident about the standard, and about what's coming, and everybody can have some influence, if that makes sense. So there's lots of tools that use it and the standard format means we have interoperability between every aspect of our API lifecycle. Really think with OpenAPI that it's, it can be quite a steep learning curve. It can be difficult to get started, but it is maybe not easy, but not that hard once you know how. So in this talk, I'm going to try and show you something about the structure, something about the tools and get you in the position where you can do your magic using this standard format. I touched on the API lifecycle, um, so I wanted to kind of drill into that a little bit more. Uh, when you work on an API, typically there's some sort of design phase, there's a requirements uh, stage, we normally know what we're going to build. Uh, normally, I like to think that we are proposing the changes to open API at this stage if we are design versed. Not every organization works that way. And I hope that what I'm going to share with you today will fit in some way in whatever workflow you find yourself in this role, and perhaps the next. Then we build it and then we go on and publish it. I'm hoping that I'm going to share my experience. I've been an API uh, developer, integrator, consultant. I've worked for providers. Now I work for a tooling vendor. I've been in developer advocacy for a few years before moving back into developer experience for tools, being just a bit closer to engineering. So I've got a bunch of things to tell you. Um, and I hope there's something here that helps you. So I'm going to show you around open API as a structure. I am making a big assumption here that you are using docs as code or a similar type of workflow. Um, Open API is the input to generating API reference documentation, just like Markdown is for our other docs sites. A lot of the resources for Open API are more for coders or for people who are implementing tools against the specification, not so much for documentarians. I think the key is to understand the concepts and some of the specific features that make our documentation really special. Uh, so this is just for you and this audience. Okay. Here is a visual representation of the structure of an open API file. Now the open API files, the JSON format, the YAML format, they are often very long, like tens of thousands of lines of code. Uh, hundreds of thousands of lines, absolutely ordinary. The GitHub one, I think, is like a quarter of a million lines, something like that. So they're often very long, and it, you can get lost really easily in that many lines of any type of file. But all open API documents follow a similar structure. So they these are the top level elements as described by the specification. And Probably not every specification has every one of these and there's no rules about what order they should be in, but I've picked a fairly conventional order. Uh, and I want to just pick out a couple of things that we'll talk about and then we'll drill into some detail on each of these. Open API is always the first thing in the file. I don't think it has to be actually, um, but typically it is. And it'll tell you what version of OpenAPI the rest of the file uses. 
This is different to the version information in the info block where you can say what version of the API description this is. The info block also holds a bunch of other metadata and that's going to be really important when your API gets listed in catalogs or um, otherwise helping users to discover stuff. As documentarians, I'd like to share with you the external docs <laughs> top level element. I don't see this used often enough, but I have definitely been guilty of building API reference documentation where there's a beautiful landing page on the main developer site. There's lots of great resources. There's quick starts, there's tutorials and this API reference. You get into the API reference. You can't, if you land there, you can't get back again. So making sure that you have good signposting is important and the external docs is a really great way to do that, especially because the open API files are normally made available for download. So users might just have the description and not be aware of where everything else could be. The security block describes how users will authenticate if they need to for the API. Um, and there's a servers block as well. So if you have multiple servers, maybe a sandbox server or servers per region, those are all described here. We've got the tags section. This is relevant for us as documentarians because tagging often groups and organizes the endpoints together. So you can use the tags to put things that are related, even though their URLs might look different or they're not alphabetically together. You can put those together and often they'll be displayed like that. Next, I have the paths section. Paths is the real deal. It's what you're thinking of as API reference documentation. There's a URL. We describe the verb to use, all of the parameters, what the response should expect. There are usually some examples in a right hand side bar, right? We have everything. I've mentioned webhooks here. If you have an API which as well as receiving requests and returning responses, can also see that something happened and send data, then the webhooks feature is for that. Um, it's pretty common in modern APIs, but not every API will have it. The paths section doesn't quite cover this use case. So the webhooks feature was introduced in OpenAPI 3.1. Um, I helped make that happen. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, and so I've included it here. You'll see it at the top level alongside paths and alongside the components section. Components is where we keep our reusable elements. So if you have the same, uh, I don't know, product ID with the same format, the same description, the same example, the same validation rules everywhere, you define it once in components and then you use the reference to refer to it. And we'll see an example of that. Here's the info section in a little bit more detail. And here, I think I've pulled out a couple of things that I want to talk about. Um, in particular, the summary and the description fields. Um, the most important thing about the info block is to check out the open API reference or maybe some of the learning resources and look at the fields that are supported in this section. It might be that whatever you render your documentation with doesn't use all of these fields. And then the temptation is not to not to fill them in. But I think the days where an organization had an API kind of behind us, especially if you're working on APIs internally in modern, modern complex soft, software architectures, um, microservices, that kind of thing, you're going to see loads of APIs. And even the most basic ones, like typically we have a partner API, there might be some early access endpoints. So our one API with one reference doc is sort of, I feel like that's over. And we need to prepare for a world where every API is listed in a catalog or an inventory. And our metadata helps users to find what we do, what it is, and so on. So make the most of these fields. The summary and description fields both take descriptive text and they appear alongside each other almost everywhere in the open API specification. So um, with those fields, you the main difference is that summary is just text and description is just marked down. And I have an example of that in a couple of slides time. I've included the version information here. 
This can sometimes be your API version. Sometimes it can be your API description version. So you might have a new version of your API description if you have, for example, added really great examples to your API reference docs. The API hasn't changed, but the reference documentation or the description of it has. Um, it's up to you how you do this. I have very few opinions. If you're going to use semantic versioning, please do it properly. Um, just look it up and learn, learn about it. So I've built you this visualization set to talk about the structure of the, the document. And you'll be working either in JSON or in YAML. So the YAML is going to look something like this. So this is the same thing, except I squeezed external docs on because there was room. Um, this is the same thing as the previous one. This can be a little bit more difficult to look at, um, but I think it's not too bad. And I promise <laughs> when you spend enough time looking at YAML as a big part of your day, which I do, it, it gets easier to read. You start being able to pass it more easily. I have there the summary and the description. As you can see, the summary is quite short and that's because normally this will be used in like a listing page where there's multiple things and we just summarize each one. That's true for APIs in a catalog. It's true for uh, endpoints listings. Then I have the description and the description is much longer, um, a little bit more detailed and that's typical. The big difference is that description fields support markdown. Um, it's common mark. So you can add links or formatting or whatever you want to here. This can be useful both in parameter descriptions and endpoint descriptions, especially if you're linking out to extra information, lists of possible error formats, whatever extra stuff you have. In this context, the info block description, I think it's especially important because your API reference serves almost as a landing page. So it's really common to see really awesome Markdown here in particular. If you're working with Markdown, um, a couple of things that I only learned recently, despite having done documentation platforms and Markdown specifically for ages, <laughs> um, the description fields support common mark. You can use Markdown. You can use the greater than sign as the previous slide did to allow you to use line breaks that don't make it through. So if you have paragraphs of text and rules about code layout, so you, or just you wanna be able to read it, so you want to be able to wrap your text without that being in the output, then the greater than sign allows that. Um, it's technically folded text. The pipe is wrapped text and it, prefer, it preserves the new lines. So that means that you can use titles, bullet points, stuff that needs new lines to format it well, multiple paragraphs, you can do all of that. Um, I would recommend that you don't overcook this, but if you do need to lay out some nice intro, maybe link to some other things, this is how you do it. And the greater than and the pipe will help you to get the most out of having to write markdown within your YAML particularly. Let's look at the paths format. So inside the paths section of your open API, you will see every, the next layer is all the paths. So they're like the last part of the URL where the first part comes from the servers section. The last part comes from the path. So you'll see different paths and within them, you'll see um, the verbs. So the top one I have here just has a get endpoint, but the second one has both get and post. So they are nested underneath that. And you see this very nested format in OpenAPI documents. Within an individual path item, here's the top one. We've got the path, we've got the verb. The operation has an ID. This is a trap. No, it's an opportunity. This is an opportunity. The operation ID is often not displayed obviously in the documentation. So if you're working with a docs preview while you're editing, which you probably should be, you may not see it immediately, but it is used. It's used in places like um, if you click on the endpoint in the navigation on the left hand bar, it's usually the anchor fragment in the URL. 
And if you go on to use your open API description for code generation, for example, it's often going to show up as like function names or that, that kind of thing. So give your operation ID a unique and meaningful name that has something to do with the thing that it's for. Um, your future self will thank you. We've got the description. I actually don't have summary here, but I think you probably want both in most, most settings and different tools prefer different ones. We've got the tags here and I, I kind of touched on this when I was talking about the um, talking about the overall structure. So there's a main tags section where you list all your tags, you give them a short name and you write the longer description. They have like a, I think it is name and description. Each endpoint, then you just list the tags that apply. And that means that when you render documentation or anything else, you can group things by tag. So you can have the product related endpoints in one section and the user related endpoints in another section. Every path item then also has multiple responses. And those are grouped first by status code. I just got one response here because otherwise the font size would be really small. I got a 200, but you should typically have some sort of error response listed here as well. And if your endpoint can also return a 201 or some redirects, you need to, you need to describe those here. It will always describe the content type, the media type. So here I've got an example that just returns JSON, but if the endpoint can also request it in XML or I saw a CSV one the other day, then um, it would describe each of those and then give examples for them. You need a description and then we have the schema. So let's drill in a little bit on the schema. This is the, the payload, the way that we describe uh, the data that's here. Got the open API schema. I got two fields in my response schema. Uh, one is message, one is event ID, one is a string, one is a number. Uh, they both got examples and they both got descriptions. So this is gonna make really nice documentation because there's lots of context here. I think examples are kind of where the magic happens when it comes to making APIs available to end users. Uh, the goal really is to give meaningful examples for every parameter, every schema item. Um, just explain what it is and try to think about what the user needs to know. For example values, I love to be realistic, but if I can make you smile, I will. Uh, there's a high incidence of uh, cupcakes, unicorns, uh, smiles, uh, you are great, compliments, right? There's no need to be super textbook dry here. Actually, even the textbooks I've written have silly examples in. Huh. Um, I think this is really important. It's like, you know, we talk about a picture being worth a thousand words. The examples perform this function in a YAML format. And I think that's really important. So this is a schema example. The other place that you could give examples is in responses. And there you are giving an example response, which is the whole response, not just one field. And sometimes that's an opportunity for you to really, I've got a short example here because I needed to fit it on a slide, but um, for you to really tell a story, you know, if the status of the report is pending, there might not be anything else. But if the report is complete, there might be download links or some other information. And you can put those combinations of fields together to show that to your users. So, whoa, back a step. This is the same picture again, just if you're wondering what you missed. And it's the schema with the message and the event ID. In OpenAPI, we have the references function, the dollar ref notation you might have seen, which stops us from copying and pasting or having to copy and paste within our API descriptions. And the way it works is, see these schemas, we take those and we replace them with references to where they are. So we put in these dollar ref fields and you can see that it links to components and then where in the components they that thing exists. Now, 
here, I'm just using the components section in the same file, and that's ordinary. You can refer to other files. So if you have multiple API descriptions that use the same common set of stuff, you can just refer to components in another file um, and either share them or have a just a components file. From 3.1, you can have an open API description that only describes components. It doesn't have to have paths as well. It can have just paths, just webhooks, or just components. So as we move to more complex APIs and split up our specifications, that's quite a nice feature. Anyway, I replaced my schema elements with these pointers to the component section. So let's go and have a quick look at the component section. Here's the component section. So inside components, I've got schemas and my two schemas that I used in the re other response are here. You will also see uh, parameters, response bodies. You can put examples here. These are elements that you can reuse elsewhere in your specification using that $f syntax, which keeps things quite manageable, quite tidy. So that's, there's a lot more to open API, but I think this gives you the vague structure. And I don't know about you, but I have always found that navigating is the hardest thing. So this is your map. Um, and hopefully that helps you get a sense of where we are and what we're trying to do with open API, because that's important. The other thing that's important is having the tools you need to be able to do the job that you need to do. Now, I am not going to make any tool recommendations. And that is because, I mean, I work for a vendor. So, you know, I got favorites. Like I work at Redockly. Like, yes, I love I, and I work at Redockly because I love their stuff. I was a user before as an employee, but they, there are lots of tools around. They all do different things. They're all in different tech stacks. They all meet different needs. To some extent, they serve different audiences. So when you are ready to adopt a new tool in OpenAPI, I want you to go here, openapi.tools. It's a community maintained directory. Also, things are changing quite fast in this space. So I could give you advice today. And by the time you see this video, uh, it could have all changed. So always go and check out that list and evaluate what you need when you need something new. Do you need a particular set of functionality? Would you, would, is there a tech stack you'd be most comfortable working with or it would be easiest to deploy in your organization? Um, do you want support for the more modern versions of OpenAPI or some of the new um, extensions that are coming in? Or is, are you happy with what was there five years ago? That's your call, different things will suit you differently. That said, I want to talk about the different categories of tool that I think make the biggest impact for documentarians in particular. And sometimes it feels like the developers are keeping the best tools for themselves. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a lot here that's really relevant um, for writers and educators. The best editor on the planet is the one that you know best. So my opening recommendation is always look at what you use now and what support you can get for that. Typically, I would say the best way to work with OpenAPI is in a programmer's editor using plugins specific to this job. So for example, I use VS Code um, and I use it with a specific YAML plugin that does folding, the Redockly OpenAPI plugin, which does really great open API syntax highlight and a bit of autocomplete, which is nice. And it does the live documentation preview to the right hand side. So I can see what I've done as I'm editing the description. I also use a plugin called something like indent rainbow. It colors each tab indent a different color. And it means that you can very easily follow the vertical lines and it will show you if you have indented the wrong number of spaces. This is brilliant if you work with YAML or anything else that's white space fussy. I think I learned it first with Python and now I use it everywhere. Totally, it sounds small and trivial, totally recommend. There are also some graphical editors. So um, API Curio Studio, Stoplight Studio, there are a few around. If that's your preference, those things exist um, and you should check those out as well. Let's talk about 
open API and governance. Let's talk about standards. Now, sometimes this is a documentarian responsibility or you'll be involved in the API council. Sometimes it's not, but I still think the awareness is really valuable. Some of the standards that we can apply with the tools are documentation standards. So um, talk about with your with your team, talk about the standards and make sure you've got the tooling to support that. Agree the written standards. I mean, the fast way, right, is to start from existing standards. Zalando have some really good ones and they're public. Um, so that's one option. If you are doing this on an existing API, I tend to advise you to start super small. Like just agree, it's always gonna be plural kebab case and we'll always have examples. Like if you can get that far, it's big progress and then you can iterate. I'm going to talk about the tooling, but also you need humans to check the changes, right? The automation can't tell you this is a stupid name. Um, you will regret calling this item. Um, I once worked for a company that had an endpoint that was called account, but kind of wasn't. It was sort of user. And then we introduced the concept of accounts. The whole thing was so confusing. So just think hard about how you should name this thing and don't leave it to the engineer that ends up implementing the ticket because they may not be naming things experts and they shouldn't have to be. Like, let's put the hive mind on it and get it the best it can be. I really recommend having tooling for checking API standards. Um, again, there are a bunch. Please check out the list. I'm using uh, Redockly, but Spectral is also really well known and there are a bunch of others. Put this, you can run it locally, but also put it in your continuous integration, wherever your open API description lives. And this means that you can always tell, oh yeah, we're, we're missing something. Oh, this isn't ready to publish. Oh, we need to add a thing. Thoroughly recommend. Most engineers as well are used to having like linting and syntax checking and stuff on their code. So I find adding it on open API, or I also do this for pros with Vail, works really well. And like I say, just start really small. Documentation generators, again, totally biased. Um, but my top tip is read the documentation for your documentation tool, right? Because they all do different things. They all have different features, different levers you can pull, different presentation options, different code sample options, right? Read the docs for your docs. Find out what you can do. Again, put your documentation tooling into your continuous integration. So especially with a design first workflow where you're making open API changes before you've built any code, if you can generate docs from that, that's a really easy way to get stakeholders to give feedback, to involve people, to be transparent in the planned changes. It can be really helpful to get the feedback that you need before you invest in building the tool. We talk a lot in the tech industry about shifting things left, like deciding things earlier in the process rather than building them and then having to change them, which is slow and expensive and error prone and frankly annoying as well, especially if you're the person that built it. Make sure that you can build and deploy your docs very easily, very reliably, very automatically and very often. Um, this way it's easy to fix a typo or a broken link or and you will. If it's a big hassle, it tends to affect the quality. Also make sure that you know where the data goes from those pages. Track your key metrics that might be as simple as page views. You might look at which endpoints people click on from the navigation. Just get a sense of are more people using our API now than before or come, more people come into the docs than before. Um, you know, do, we, do people spend a lot of time on the auth section? Maybe we need to work on that. Um, there's lots of things here that can make your documentation better. I want to close with a message for all of you that work on documentation for APIs. You can sometimes be quite a long way down the process, um, like further to the right than we necessarily want to be. Um, but, you know, Postman in their most recent state of the API report, 55% of their responders said that lack of documentation was the biggest obstacle to consuming APIs, right? I think we're beyond the point where anyone would publish an API with no documentation, but sometimes it would be better. I've seen some bad ones. The work that we do as documentarians, as 
really improves the developer experience, the API experience. It makes a big difference. It's important work. I've given you something here that I hope lets you raise your game, but remember that you're already awesome. And everyone who uses your APIs is grateful for what you do. So thank you. That's it from me. Got a few resources for you here. If there's anything else you'd like to talk about, just reach out to me. And thank you for listening.